in telling us in the first episode of Yellow Jackets just how bad things will get before the team makes it out of the wilderness, the show set itself up to not be about the things that happen, but how the characters react to those things. The first season left us with a lot of questions about what those things would be, and the question of what happened to Shauna's first baby was high on that list. I suppose if you had told me that they would pull a fake out, I probably wouldn't have liked that idea. But I think they managed to pull off a twist that adds to whatever comes next without taking anything away. I had a really strange experience while I was watching that I think is worth mentioning though. After my weekly ritual of getting tired of refreshing the Paramount Plus app to see if the episode had shown up yet, I clicked over to the press site where I noticed that the episode 7 photos were posted. That gave away the title of the next episode, which seemed to confirm my suspicions that there was no way the baby would survive. Then, as I got to the point in the episode where Shauna is holding this large, robust baby boy, my wife came into my office and asked for my help with something that she said wouldn't take very long. So for the next 15 minutes while I was doing that, I cycled through the whole, it has to be a dream, so what are they trying to do? What are the reasons behind doing it that way? And when I came back and rewound it a bit and started from the beginning of that scene, it seemed pretty obvious with the cut to black and the way that they were all smiling like they were in Jackie's death dream that it was some sort of unreality. The point of this is not to say that anyone should have seen what was happening, but rather that even feeling 90% sure it wasn't real didn't take away from the emotional impact. And the fact that it wasn't real to anyone else except Shauna, who dreamed it, doesn't change the way that she felt in the closing shot when faced with the reality of what happened. I'll come back around to that at the end, but I think that all ties in nicely with the idea that none of what they experience has to be real in order to have an effect on them given the situation. People look for answers and explanations when they're presented with something that's inexplicable, and that provides fertile ground for the writers as they continue to fill in the gaps between the two timelines. The answer to what happened to Shauna's baby is cut and dry, and it's nice to put that one to bed, but then I do have to wonder how the Lottie followers will make sense of their failed bloodletting ritual, or what might still be to come since adult Lottie went back to cutting her palm in the present day timeline just a couple of episodes back. As far as Yellow Jackets episodes go, this was a pretty straightforward one, but there's still a lot to talk about. Thankfully, it ends with the whole band back together at Lottie's compound, which I think should elevate things from here on out. To get there, we had to get through Shauna and her family being called to the police station. I'm sure this isn't where that story ends, but it does feel like we'll get a reprieve from it, and all things considered, it ended on a high note. Jeff jamming out to NWA in the parking lot, Callie running with the idea that Shauna planted when she said it would have been better if she had sex with Officer Syracusa, and a really great look inside Shauna's thought processes as she breaks down under questioning about Adam. In that, you really see how her past affects her present when she says, you have a kid that you don't want to save a marriage that you got into out of guilt and shame, and you just, you can't really let yourself love either of them. This is probably the most honest thing anyone has said in this show, and of course, the detective thinks it's all part of some elaborate plan rather than being a sincere confession. I guess in a weird way that might actually help her in the long run. Obviously, she's leaving the part about stabbing Adam out of her story, but she is saying some rather incriminating things that she probably shouldn't. But he also has reason not to believe her because of the Randy situation at the motel. What seems more important is that what she says here ties in with what happens to her younger self at the end of the episode and explains a lot about who she is in the present day timeline. She's saying that being afraid that she'll lose Callie or Jeff the same way she lost her baby is why she's never been good at loving them. Even though she never wanted to be a mom, she doesn't believe that she started out a bad person. And of course, she does love her family. She loves them despite herself, but she feels like she's incredibly bad at it. Seeing her have the dream of what could have been with the wilderness baby and pairing that with this revelation about how she sees herself now sinks the two timelines together. Callie's invoking Matt's weird ass balls will probably buy them some time, although it's probably also going to ensure that he doubles down in coming after them. 
I'm not sure if the phone call from Ty and the way she decided to take Jeff's advice to go to Lottie's were some of the episode's finest moments, but I think it does make sense for her to want to be there when she finds out everyone's coming back together. If for no other reason than being with the people who understand the thing that made her the person she just described in that interview. Out in Ohio, things are a little uncomfortable, especially for Van. She explains that she talked to the other Ty and tells her that she said we're not supposed to be here. I'm not 100% sure that's all that happened, but I guess if Ty doesn't remember, then it's between Van and her altar. Either way, her reaction of being surprised at the idea of us referring to them makes sense. After all, Ty is still married to Simone. She's not wrong to keep her distance, and we see her do that throughout their interactions. Misty's call from the kitchen phone at Lottie's gets them moving in that direction. And across the board, everyone seems completely surprised that Lottie is running a wellness business rather than being locked up in an institution in Switzerland. Speaking of Misty, it didn't take her long to warm up to the attention she gets at the compound because she knows Nat and Lottie. Her emptying her pockets on arrival was super fun, and it's also super fun that I'm not sure if those are things that she always carries around with her, or if it's a specific kit that she put together for her mission with Walter. I'm incredibly curious to find out what the messages he sent to her say, but we'll probably have to wait for a while before she sees them. Lottie isn't happy to see her at first, but comes around and asks her to stay. We learn later that her reaction wasn't about feelings she has for Misty personally, but that her showing up fits into fears that she's having about the past coming back to her. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but once again, her visit with the psychiatrist was a little off. It's the same actor playing the role, but this time we don't see her face at all. Last time I thought it was odd that they chose to add the detail that this was a replacement therapist rather than the regular person she sees. There were a lot of theories that were thrown around about what might be going on with that, and a lot of criticism about the advice she gave her. And while this encounter didn't take any of those ideas off the table, it felt different in that it focused things back on Lottie. Not showing her face here is definitely another choice that makes the meeting suspicious, but now it feels more like maybe this is all in Lottie's head or just a way to show that she's losing her grip on reality. It's something that'll be in the back of my mind, but not nearly as interesting as what Lottie actually says. By this point, the idea of Lottie only being an opportunistic cult leader preying on her followers is a little hard to square. Just as her younger self seems more reluctant to take power than it seemed like she would have been at the end of the last season, the adult does appear to want to help people rather than just exploiting them. She doesn't appear to be completely honest or absolutely pure in her intentions, but she's not entirely predatory either. In relation to what we see with Shauna at the police station, it becomes clear that what Lottie does is more of a reaction to the things that happened in her life, essentially a trauma response rather than her being a cult leader in the traditional sense. In hindsight, this makes perfect sense based on the themes at play, but the way they presented the character at the end of last season made it seem like there might be something different going on with her. Earlier in the season, we saw that even though she uses the symbol and some of her rituals resemble what happened in the woods, she has regrets about what they did out there just like everyone else does. What's more is that she tells her psychiatrist that she's not worried that she's ill, but that she's never been ill. In other words, what she experienced back then was real rather than symptoms of her mental illness. Travis, Natalie, and Misty all showing up at the same time feels like the power of that place, the god of that place, is sending them to show her that it's real. She says they did terrible things in its name when they were out there, and now she realizes that they brought it back with them. This is all influenced by the session that she had with Nat in the last episode, which is having a profound effect on both of them. And the show finally found a clever way to make Lisa a little more compelling. After the session, Nat is at a place where she's essentially seeing things as they are, instead of how she chose to twist them. But at the same time, she's somewhat overcompensating in blaming herself for what happened. She explains this to Lisa when she tells her she should stay away from her because she ruins people and that she's poison. She says that she killed Travis, the only person she loved and the only person who knew her, and she's been blaming it on Lottie, but now she believes it was her own fault. 
Lisa gives her her fish to take care of and a way to get her to get ready to take care of herself, which works well with what we've seen between these two, because even though Nat has been making a mess of her own life, she was capable of giving Lisa some sound advice. When she asks why she forgave her for stabbing her in the face, she says, Suffering is inevitable, and only by meeting it with compassion can we begin to grow, which is probably something that she learned from Lottie. It's clever because she's using things she picked up from them to point out what they haven't been able to do in their own lives based on the lasting effects of their time in the wilderness. This spills over into her interaction with Misty as well. You see her bring up Walter and Misty's reaction to that and realize that he presented himself as a character that was offering exactly what she was looking for, accepting her for who she is, and she wasn't able to let him in. And that makes Nat ending their conversation with the question, we're all like this, aren't we? Perfect. This episode is about Shauna, and what she goes through deserves most of our attention, but now that we're nearing the end of the season, I do find it very promising that we get such important revelations right along with that that feel complementary. In a season where the adults have largely been split up, this is all pointing at how much they can offer each other as they come back together, while at the same time, we see the divisions between them solidifying in the 96 timeline. Before we get to Shauna's really intense labor, we take a brief flashback to the before times, which is kind of fun because that's not something we normally do. And we see them in health class and the team's brief education on childbirth that no one pays attention to except for Misty. Although this won't be enough to help, and in the end I suppose it doesn't matter because the baby never had a chance to survive a natural birth in these conditions. In that way, Misty's freezing up seemed to be more about reminding us that Crystal had just died and that keeping that secret was taking a toll on her. It also provides a chance for Akela to step up and take center stage for a while, and a chance for Lottie to give Misty a pep talk that brings her back around, although she refers to the baby here as our baby, which is a little bit creepy. It also sets up another dream sequence from Coach Ben, imagining what his life would have been like with his boyfriend Paul. This time they play charades, and they're in a room that is a combination of the cabin and his apartment. After seeing so many of these, which all just seem to show the deterioration of his mental state, it's hard to see them as anything other than the setup for the end of his story. There were popular theories that this might be something that would reignite his will to survive, but as you see the cabin start to take over his fantasy land, that makes it seem unlikely that he'll ever leave there. Two other things stand out as being important in shaping the aftermath of this tragic event. The first is that we see Lottie try to help comfort Shauna in a way that I think shows some of her personal limits. In the previous episode, Shauna made it clear that she was freaked out by Lottie's interest in her baby, and she freaked out when she woke up to her whispering to her belly. The fact that she tries to touch Shauna while she's in the middle of all this pain makes me think that she has a blind spot when it comes to being able to take the temperature of whatever it is that's happening around her. Sure, this is an intense situation and you can't expect people to be at their best, but this sequence stood out as her being blatantly out of touch with how Shauna feels about her in that moment. The second thing is that Travis is the one that initiates their impromptu bloodletting ritual. This makes more sense in a way. Everyone in that room that's never delivered a baby is somewhat powerless to change the outcome of what's happening. It's believable that they might try for a spiritual solution or a supernatural one if you prefer, as this is starting to be normal in the group anyway. The thing about him being the one to start at this time, though, is that the baby still dies. So it becomes a test of faith rather than something that reinforces their beliefs. I think that as things get worse, their desire to believe will increase. They'll get more irrational about it. So I wonder if this will solidify Lottie's role as being the special one. There's still a chance that something else will happen that they'll look at as a reward for what they did here, specifically spilling blood, but it would have to be something big considering how crushed everyone is about the baby. And I do want to stress that this was a devastatingly painful episode for Shauna's character, and one where Sophie Nalise delivers a career-defining performance. While there are moments of hope that things might turn around, the birth is pretty much doomed from the beginning. 
I don't know any more about the birthing process than the people in that cabin, but the internet tells me that if the placenta comes out first, the baby will almost always die short of an emergency C-section since it's no longer getting oxygen, and the mother's chances of survival are also very low. With that in mind and Ty's declaration that she lost so much blood, I think of the dream sequence as another near-death experience. As I mentioned, when you go back and look at it again, it certainly resembles Jackie's death dream. And I know that the subtitles say it's Misty, but I agree with the people who were posting that it sounds like it's Jackie's voice saying Shauna when she first wakes up into it. Again, the fact that it's a dream doesn't take away from what happens, and I actually think it'll turn out to be very important. It's all very difficult to watch knowing how things end, especially the turn where she begs the baby to latch, and the way she says, it's you and me, kid, it's you and me against the whole world. There we get to see her experience Joy when he finally starts feeding, only to have that ripped away. First in the dream where her fear about losing him and her regret over eating Jackie manifest in her seeing the others eating him. And then again when she wakes up and finds out the truth. Confronted with that, it's not surprising that she chooses denial. Once more, I have to say that the young actor delivered that in a way that was absolutely haunting. I didn't have a strong reaction to the cannibalism scene here because that was the moment I knew for sure that it was a dream based on the creator's assurances that they wouldn't eat the baby. But I did have a strong reaction to the closing shot. We get to see the grief on each of the girls' faces that were there to witness that, and then we see each of them move out of the frame so that Sean is all alone in the final seconds with her loss and impending sorrow. Beyond the performance and the gut punch of the death, I keep going back to Lottie saying that the baby would change everything. I think this changes things in a way that isn't immediately apparent because this was something that kept them all together. In their desperate situation, it was something to look forward to, not just for Shauna, but for the group as a whole. Clearly, Lottie's thought was that the birth would bring them all together and give them something to survive for. So now that the thing is gone, what are they left with? I think the fear of the people closest to her bleeding through into Shauna's dream is a sign of where her head will be, and her dislike of Lottie will continue to grow. In a coming split, Nat is the only one you could see taking her side without question. Ty is generally on her side, but her allegiances are split because of Van. And in this episode, we saw her give in and start to try to do the chanting, which seemed like it kind of worked when they were lost in the snowstorm. Javi also seems to feel a certain way about Lottie, but he's barely even speaking, so it's hard to say where he would stand. And I don't know who else that leaves except maybe Coach Ben? But more important than how people might take sides is how they're going to react to this insanely traumatic experience on top of everything else that's happening. I thought this was the best episode of the season so far, partially because we saw all the adults come back together and there's a lot of anticipation about what's going to happen there. But I think we're seeing the opposite happen in the woods. And I think that means that things are going to take a dark turn. And I think that is a great place to leave things. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.